Okay. Um, is that recording now, Kiel? Yeah. In the top left, you can see the recording uh, button, the little red yeah. thing. Okay. Right. Sorry about that. Um, okay. So, in terms of um, where were we? In terms of exam tips. Um, so I think the other thing to remember um, is that understanding AIDS retention. Um, so I find, you know, it's much better rather than just rote learning the content, it's much better to really understand, you know, how it all fits together to understand like the clinical applications, the relationships, and perhaps, you know, like why, give yourself a little bit of a reason, like why the body is formed in this way. That's also really important. Um, and we've also got some do's and don'ts courtesy of a past revision lecturer. So do um, relax, look after yourself, um, feed and water yourself, as they say. Do some previous exams. Past exam questions are a really good indicator of what will probably be on your exam this year. Um, do the Moodle quizzes, really helpful revision again. And do look over the pathologies and clinical concepts you've studied in your anatomy tutes and the anatomy in ICL. So the clinical concepts are the things they like to ask you um, well, I should probably say the clinical concepts are the things that are the most relevant um, for us studying anatomy in a medicine context, and they are the things most likely to come up on your exam. And don'ts, so don't learn the entirety of more and dallies or any textbook or any matter. Um, don't waste hours on low yield content, and I'll flag some of that low yield content as we go through. And don't spend the night before the exam studying or not sleeping. Um, yeah, don't cram and I guess, um, you know, have confidence in yourself. Um, there's no need to pull an all-nighter. Right, next slide. And yes, um, as they say, anatomical relationships actually do matter and we'll see that throughout this lecture, um, especially kind of looking at it in th a 3D space. Right, so we'll start off with the thorax. Um, so at the start of each section, um, thorax, cardio, and then back, I've got a few learning objectives. And these learning objectives are pretty much taken um, from your PRAC book and some of the um, tutorial uh, information in that book as well. Um, I guess I put them here to like provide a really sort of um, brief and concise guide um, for you to base your studies around and also to give some direction to this lecture. And the topics here really have a bit of a, if you will, um, happy medium between having just, you know, the bare minimum topics and like having, you know, excessive topics like, you know, everything in the textbook. Um, so I think this is a really good guide, um, you know, for what you really need to know going into second year and um, of course for your exams. And as a general rule, um, if it isn't a learning objective on here um, or in your book, it isn't likely to be of much importance. Um, for your clinical years or for your exam. Right, so um, start off with the ribs. So the ribs are typically only found um, on thoracic vertebra and there are 12 of them. Um, you can sometimes have pathological cervical, uh, cervical, sorry, ribs, um, but you'll hear more about them next year. In terms of the categorization of ribs, um, there's two systems, so there's true pardon me, true, false and floating, and typical and atypical. So in terms of true, false and floating, um, let's move our mouse, to true, false and floating. So you can see ribs one to seven, um, they're called true ribs. And the reason they are called true ribs is that ribs one to seven all attach um, to the sternum at their anterior end. And all, of course, like all ribs originate from the vertebral bodies. Um, in terms of false ribs, they're ribs eight nine, 8, 9, and 10. And these ribs are called false ribs because although they come from the vertebral bodies, they don't have direct cartilaginous attachments to the sternum. They attach into this sort of cartilaginous belt, if you will. So it's only indirectly attached to the sternum. Um, in terms of floating ribs, these are ribs 11 and 12, and these don't have any anterior attachments to any structures. So you can see here with rib 12, which is kind of sort of ends um, here doesn't really attach anteriorly. And then there's typical and atypical ribs. So a typical rib, um, let's check my next slide. Sorry, let's see if I've got better information. Um, not really, okay. So a typical rib has a head, a neck, a tubercle and a body. Um, so if you, I guess, look at, it's kind of hard to see um, a full typical rib here, but the head is basically 
the bit that attaches onto the vertebral body. Um, the midline, the tubercle is the next bit along that usually attaches to a um, to the transverse costal process, which we'll come to later. Um, and then you've got a body, which is this thing that comes around. Um, and then the neck is the bit in between the head and the tubercle. Um, and then you've got atypical ribs. Um, so they're ribs one, two, and 10, 11, and 12. And these ones um, often lack one or multiple of these features. So for example, ribs 11 and 12 um, don't exactly you know, have much of a, uh, well, certainly rib 12 doesn't really have much of a tubercle. And um, some of them have additional features. So like ribs one and two, they have grooves um, for structures to pass through them. And that will become more important next year. Right, so the ribs um, kind of part two. Um, the other thing you need to know about the ribs is kind of how they move and how they articulate. Um, so actually starting with the articulation, this second part here. Um, so the tubercle um, articulates with the transverse um, process of the vertebra. Um, and the transverse process has a costal facet. Um, and that's like the bit of the transverse process that directly touches the rib. Um, the head of the rib articulates with the body of the vertebra. And uh, you can see that this articulation on the vertebra, um, it's a kind of little bit on the vertebra above and a little bit on a vertebra below. Um, so the rib is first of all named according to the vertebra below. So the T7 rib, um, sorry, the seventh rib will have T7 as a vertebral body that attaches to inferiorly. And um, this will be called the uh, sort of inferior articular um, costal facet, and then the top one is a superior um, costal facet, but we'll get to that later. Um, in terms of movements, um, there are two types of movements. Um, so there's something called a bucket handle movement um, for the lateral part of the ribs. So if you kind of imagine like a bucket, and then you got like the handle that curves around. Um, so, you know, when you like pull the handle, it sort of goes up and down, like in this kind of sort of, you can see this like circle shape moving up and down. That's um, the bucket handle movement. And then a pump handle movement is like when you have a pump um, and you like pull one end and then it pushes um, the sternum up and down. Um, I'll show that in a little bit more detail in the next slide. So um, the ribs, um, a lot of them attach to the sternum, which is the other skeletal structure in the thorax seem to know. So it's basically got three parts and a nubrium at the top a body and a xiphoid process. Um, and in terms of the joints, there's a manubriosternal joint between the manubrium and the sternum body, and then the xiphosternal joint between the xiphoid process and the sternal body. Um, hopefully that's pretty straightforward. Just kind of combine the names. Um, the manubriosternal joint, this thing, is also a very important landmark. Um, you might've heard of it as the angle of Louis as well. And that's clinically um, quite important. Um, for a few reasons, uh, which you'll probably hear about in the clinical skills lecture. Um, and kind of this also provides a useful landmark for finding the second rib um, highlighted in yellow here. So the second rib joins on to the manubrio sternal joint. And in terms of this pump handle movement, um, so if you can so I've got like two pens to illustrate this. So if you kind of imagine this pen here is the sternum, and then like this is one of, this is a rib um, coming onto it. Um, so basically the rib, like a, you know, if you pull down a pump, it will kind of move down and then it will move up and then this moves the sternum correspondingly. Hopefully that made some sense. Um, okay, and then the other part of the skeletal structure, um, skeletal, sorry, thoracic wall is the intercostal muscles and intercostal nerves. So in terms of the intercostal muscles, um, you can see that there are three layers, the innermost, the internal, and the external. And um, a really nice thing to know is the directions each of these layers go. So innermost um, is just vertical, up, down, internal. Um, you kind of remember it by like hands on your chin. So um, when you put your hands on your chin, you can see that um, basically as you go, um, as you go sort of medially and anteriorly, um, you know, the kind of it goes up superiorly. Um, and then external is hands and pockets. So if you imagine putting your hands in your pockets when you're setting up, they're kind of like this. 
Um, so basically, as you go anteriorly and medially, um, you go inferiorly, otherwise known as antero-inferiorly. Um, the intercostal muscles, the main thing they do is inspiration um, and forced exhalation. Um, they're sort of, if you like, accessory muscles of respiration. You might have heard that term. They sort of just help um, respiration. And there are also some other muscles like transversus thoracus and subcostals. Um, you don't really need to know them. Um, they don't do a lot. Um, but if you kind of, I guess, like to see where they are, just a little diagram here showing the location of the um, transversus thoracus. Right. Um, now, this part is very important, the intercostal neurovascular bundles. So um, in terms of kind of how this works, uh, it's important to remember that there are two neurovascular bundles in each um, in each intercostal space, a superior one and an inferior one, otherwise known as the collateral bundle. Um, so as you might suspect, the superior one is the main bundle, the collateral bundle isn't very important um, for, from a functional perspective. So in terms of the anatomy, um, kind of we use kind of a vein mnemonic to remember um, the way the structures go. So vein, superiorly, then artery in the middle and intercostal nerve most inferiorly. Um, in the collaterals, um, just remember the van as being sort of flipped. Um, in, again, like it might seem a bit abstract at first, but um, the more you uh, look at it, the easier it will be. So the veins on the bottom, artery is in the middle and the nerves at the top. Um, so in terms of the clinical concepts, as I said, um, the intercostal bundles, the superior ones, um, they're, the ones that supply most of your thoracic wall, the collateral ones, they're just there to help, um, which means that if you want to do a thoracocentesis, otherwise known as a pleural tap, um, you always aim for the bottom of the intercostal space. So in that way you will get the collateral, which are very important, and um, sorry, which are not very important. So you can, doesn't really matter if you break them in half, um, but with the superior ones, they won't be damaged. Now, let me just check something in the chat. So it says, so if you were aiming to miss the nerves for the third rib, wouldn't you insert the needle just superior to that rib? Yes, exactly. Um, another way to look at it is you just go above um, the rib. So yeah, you just go above the rib or at the bottom of the intercostal space. Great. Um, and then, oh yeah, then there's another thing which you might um, want to know is that in penetrating wounds, um, that's also another situation where some of these intercostal bundles can get damaged. Right, so in terms of the arterial and venous supply, um, this isn't exactly the most um, important topic either, but um, I would say that the artery, if you want to learn either of these, um, choose the arteries. So the arteries, um, basically we can divide it up into an anterior and a posterior circulation. Um, so if you Go back to, we go back to the previous slide, um, you can see the intercostal arteries. There's actually an anterior intercostal artery and a posterior intercostal artery. So um, the anterior intercostal artery, they come off the internal thoracic artery, which itself comes off the right and left subclavian arteries. Um, so you can see in the image here, one of the first branches of the subclavian is the internal thoracic, which becomes the anterior intercostals. Um, the posterior intercostals are supplied directly from the descending thoracic aorta, um, which isn't shown in this picture. In terms of the veins, um, kind of knowing about the azagous, hemiazagous vein venous system is kind of nice, um, but you don't really need a lot of detail for that for first year. Um, but just kind of remember that the venous drainage is split into a right and a left um, sided if you will, system, as opposed to sort of the um, anterior and posterior division of the arteries. So on the right, it all comes from the azagous vein, you can see here, and on the left, it all comes from the hemiazagous and accessory hemiazagous veins, as you can see here. Um, there is a little bit of an exception, which you don't exactly need to know for first year, which I put in the speaker notes if you're interested. Um, and both of these veins do drain into the um, superior vena cava, by the azagous vein at the angle of Louis, that T4, T5 um, manubrio sternal joint thing that we were talking about. Right, in terms of the diaphragm, um, the diaphragm 
is the primary muscle of inspiration, um, which you will learn more about when you do respiratory anatomy next year. Um, but the key important thing to know um, for year one is the apertures. Um, so there's three of them. There's the cable opening at T8. Um, and as the name suggests, it's got the vena cava. It's also got some of the phrenic nerve branches. Um, then you've got the esophageal hiatus at T10. It's got the esophagus um, and also some branches of the vagus nerve, um, which become vagal trunks um, as you get, as they sort of wrap around the esophagus. Um, the name basically is the same nerve, the name just changes. Um, in, and then there's the aortic hiatus at the T12 level. It's got the descending aorta as well as the azagus and hemiazagus veins and um, the thoracic duct as well, which you probably don't need to know too much about. In terms of the innervation, um, probably one of the a good mnemonic is um, C3, C4, C5, keeps the diaphragm alive. Um, so it's the phrenic nerve um, innervating the diaphragm with the nerve roots C3, C4 and C5. Um, other things you need to know are that there is a central tendon. So you can see, you know, this big white bit in the middle. So the way the diaphragm works is that actually all the muscle fibers come from this big white bit, the central tendon in the middle, and then radiate out to the sides as they attach to body wall. So that's really important to wrap your head around. Um, the diaphragm also has these things called crurae or legs, um, which aren't visible on this picture. But you may have seen, I guess, in your tutorials, um, sort of like around here, there's this um, left leg looking thing that comes down. That's the left cross. And then on the other side on the right, there's another um, leg looking thing that comes down. That's the right cross. Um, that's probably all you need to know about them, that they exist. And, oh yeah, and one um, like mnemonic, um, which you could use, I guess, to remember what goes through which um, opening. So I guess um, if you're like a car person, you could think of, you know, V8. So, you know, there's like V8 engines. So the vena cava is in T8. E10 is in like E10 petrol. Um, so the esophageal hiatus, um, spelt with an E in the American spelling, goes through T10. And then um, 12 is just whatever's left over. So then that's just um, the aorta. And a couple of questions. Um, so I'll start with, uh, with okay, is this diagram looking down to up? Ah, sorry. Um, yes. So the diagram, hang on, let me just double check. Wait a second. No, um, the diagram is actually a little bit opposite um, to all the other diagrams you have. So sorry, that might have been a bit confusing. Um, so the diagram actually is looking, starting up looking down, um, which is probably the opposite of what you're used to. Um, but yeah, that's just the way this diagram works. Um, And uh, in terms of the mnemonic, um, okay, so the mnemonic, um, I'll just, so it's um, V8, so vena cava T8, um, E10, esophageal high esophagus um, T10, and then um, whatever's left over is in 12. Um, so then that's just basically the aorta and the azagus system. Right. Hopefully that all um, kind of was clear. Okay, so now moving on to the mediastinum. Um, so basically the mediastinum is the cavity that will contain the heart and essentially is the middle cavity in between the two lung cavities. So you imagine, you know, there being two lungs on the side, the thing in the middle, um, two plural cavities on the side, the thing in the middle is the mediastinum and that contains the heart. Um, a really important, I guess, Boundary in the mediastinum is the sternal angle. Um, so that's the manubrium of the sternum and then um, between the T4 and T5 vertebrae posteriorly. And that demarcates uh, the superior mediastinum from the other parts, the anterior, the middle and the posterior mediastinum. Um, so as you can see, um, yeah, well, the structures listed on the left, um, which I guess you can go through in your own time. Um, I won't or read them all out because that's probably a waste of time. But the ones that are important are in bold. Um, the rest of them you'll probably get to uh, in later years. Right, so the nerves in the mediastinum. Um, I guess at your level, um, it's just important to know that there are three nerves in the mediastinum, three main ones. So there's the phrenic nerve, um, which innervates the diaphragm. 
there's a vagus nerve um, which goes and innervates the heart through the cardiac plexus and the esophagus um, and the esophageal plexus. You don't really need to know a lot about the plexuses, just know that the vagus nerve does the heart and the esophagus. And then there's a sympathetic um, chain ganglia and a sympathetic trunk at the back. Right, so moving on to the heart, um, cardiac anatomy. Uh, quote there is the most deadly disease truly is the failure of the heart. Um, and I think that's a really kind of nice quote on multiple levels um, to leave you to, I guess, ponder that. But in terms of the learning objectives, so again, taking from the manual, um, some learning objectives, I guess what you really need to know is um, the pericardium as a cavity and the pericardial membrane. Um, you need to know the basic structures of the heart. Um, so kind of the valves, um, the chambers, and of course the great vessels. And um, you need to know a little bit about the variability of the heart and thoracic wall um, vasculature and the normal vascular patterns as well. And in italics under there, um, there are some clinical concepts that we're going to go through. Um, so fluid accumulation for the pericardium um, and cardiac tamponade. Um, for the heart, we've got the apex beat external thrust, valvular stenosis and regurgitation, as well as um, pericardial pain. And for the vasculature, we've got coronary arteries and AMIs, um, and as well anastomosing of coronary arteries and slow occlusions. So notice that probably sounded like a um, bit of a word um, salad, but I'll get around to um, what they all mean a bit later. Right, so um, just a word on embryology. Um, hashtag embryology kind of matters. Um, for the exam, a surprising amount of questions, although less than 50% are actually related to embryology. Um, for, I guess, real world clinical practice, many clinical conditions of the heart actually have an embryological origin. So it's actually kind of nice to understand. Um, the details of it, I won't go into. I will just talk about um, one part of it. Um, but basically there's some twisting, some folding, um, a membrane forms in the middle called the septum and um, a change in circulation pattern. The video um, that's linked here um, is a very, very good video um, that puts everything incredibly succinctly and with incredible amount of accuracy. Um, so definitely recommend watching that. And yeah, I'll just touch on some clinically relevant embryology. Okay, right. So um, before we get started into the nitty gritty of what's inside each chamber in each vessel, um, let's just go through the basics of the heart. So the heart has a base and an apex. Um, so the apex you can see here is the pointy bit at the end. And let's go to the next slide. The base, um, if you look at the image on the left, is this part at the back, um, you know, where all the vessels come in and out. Um, the heart also has a right atrium and a right ventricle and a left atrium, um, which is a little bit more on the back and the left ventricle. And the heart also has several margins. So, um, which you, you don't really need to know the names of these, but this one is the inferior margin and this one is the oblique, um, sorry, the obtuse uh, margin. And um, between each of the ventricles, um, there is a septum, which I'll talk about a bit later. And um, also, between the atrium ventricles, there are valves. Um, so in terms of what the great vessels are, um, there are four groups of great vessels. So there's the aorta, um, which forms an arch, descending aorta and a bunch of branches. There's a pulmonary trunk. Um, so this goes out from the right ventricle to the right and left lungs. Mm, pardon me. Um, so the aorta and the pulmonary trunk are our two outflow vessels. Um, and then there's also the SVC and IVC. So you can see the superior vena cava coming at the top here and the inferior vena cava at the bottom here. Both of these drain into the right ventricle. Um, I'll go into the blood flow in a sec. And there's also four pulmonary veins. So just looking at this picture here, you can see the pulmonary veins draining to the base of the heart into the left ventricle and the left atrium, um, carrying blood, oxygenated blood back from the lungs. And so uh, just a question, um, just to make sure we're on the same page, which vessels carry oxygenated blood? Can you type that in the chat? 
Anyone? Um, aorta plus pulmonary veins. Good. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. Um, you guys know your stuff. Okay. Right, um, so now we're going to just quickly go through the blood flow pattern of the heart. I think this is a really important thing to understand um, and something which probably isn't talked about enough. So um, basically, um, you can you, you kind of need to think of the heart and the lungs as a big unit um, in circulation. So um, you can start anywhere, but we usually start by thinking of the blood coming back to the heart from the rest of the body. Um, so that's these two big veins here, the SVC and IVC. And so they enter in the right atrium and then they pass into the right ventricle um, through this valve, which I'll talk more about later. And uh, once they enter the right ventricle, they go to the lungs um, via the pulmonary arteries and then they get oxygenated in the lungs and they come back into the left atrium um, via the pulmonary veins and then they go out through the left ventricle and into the rest of the body. Um, so I think it's, this is really important to understand, you know, when you think of perhaps um, the consequences of a particular type of heart failure, say for example, left ventricular failure. So from here, um, you know, we can understand, so by understanding this, we understand that in left ventricular failure, um, blood isn't getting out into the rest of the body, right? And then the blood, because it's, you know, it's kind of backing up in here, some of it will go back and push back into the lungs. Um, so, you know, this can result in excess fluid in the lungs, um, which um, you'll learn next year is called pulmonary edema. Um, so just having an understanding of that, I think is really helpful. Right. Um, okay, so the position of the heart within the mediastinum, um, this always confused me in first year, but um, the heart is kind of rotated a little bit. Um, so I guess like if you, so like instead of the heart being like straight, um, it's kind of like rotated to the left a bit um, so that in that way, um, the left, sorry, the right side is kind of like towards the front um, and then the left side's a little bit more towards the back. Um, it's also kind of like tilted out a little bit. So the apex is pointing a bit forwards. Um, that's another thing that's kind of good to know. It's um, in terms of the borders of the heart, so the right border is the right atrium. Um, the inferior border is, I don't know why that says left atrium, um, but that's actually the right ventricle. Um, sorry, I'll correct that on the post slides. Um, and the left, sorry, the right ventricle, yes. And the left border consists of the left ventricle, um, kind of a bit more sort of towards the bottom and posteriorly and then the left atrium towards the top posteriorly. And this kind of positioning of the heart is really important to understand the cardiac axis of the ECG. Um, so you know how like the normal cardiac axis is always like pointing, um, not, you know, like straight down and straight to the right, but kind of like on an angle. Um, so that's, you know, kind of a really good way to understand that. Right, so in terms of some clinical applications, um, so dextrocardia um, occurs when the heart is flipped. So if you go back to the previous image, you can see that you know, the heart normally is a bit um, on the left side of the body and oriented towards the left. Dextrocardia, it's on the right side more and um, it's oriented towards the right. And as I said before, the cardiac axis of the ECG um, is really based around on how the heart is um, a little bit rotated in the mediastinum. Right, so the pericardium. Um, the pericardium is the membrane that surrounds the heart. Um, there are sort of two components to it, um, but there's really, I guess, three layers in those two components, um, which I'll get to. So the first component is the fibrous pericardium. So that kind of acts like a hard fibrous outer shell um, around the whole thing. And that's um, kind of, if you go to this image here, um, you can see that, I guess, well, this shows the embryology as well, which I'll get to, but you can see this, you know, kind of being the outermost layer. And the fibrous pericardium, you can see here, is tethered in three directions. So I guess it's tethered at the base of the heart. Um, it's tethered to the great vessels. It's also tethered um, to the central tendon of the diaphragm. 
And it's also kind of like tethered at the apex as well, um, just at the front. In terms of the serous pericardium, this is a two layered structure. So within this serous pericardium, there are two layers. Um, there's a visceral layer, um, sometimes known as the epicardium, which is basically stuck on to the heart muscle. And then outside of that, a parietal layer, um, which is sort of stuck on to the fibrous pericardium. And in between those two layers is a bit of fluid, a serous fluid. It's like lubricating fluid. It allows the heart to slide smoothly um, as it contracts and moves. So if you look at the image on the bottom, um, this you know, really shows, I guess, nicely the embryological origins of this, which I think is helpful for understanding. So you can see at the start, um, you've got the fibrous pericardium and then the serous pericardium. Um, and then the heart carrying with it, its little visceral layer pericardium starts to push through and eventually keeps getting bigger and bigger until it fills this space almost fully and the visceral and parietal layers of the serous pericardium um, kind of come together. And uh, the fibrous pericardium is sort of just, um, I guess, around that. So I guess um, a really nice way to think about it is to think of, I guess, um, the, okay, the serous pericardium starting off as one big sheet and then the heart like kind of comes in, right? So it comes in, the visceral pericardium is the bit that's, um, the, sorry, the visceral layer of the serous pericardium is the bit that's just wrapping around the heart. And then the sheet, you know, sort of folds back to form um, the parietal layer um, of the serous pericardium. So it's all kind of one layer that sort of gets crumpled up into two layers. Um, hope that made sense. Oh, sorry, um, hope that made sense. Um, feel free to type a question in the chat if um, you'd like more clarification. Right, and then now we have the myocardium, um, which is the heart muscle proper. Um, and this is, I guess, um, you know, where most of the features of the heart are. So if we start off by looking at the atria, um, you can see that they are pectinate muscles. So they're these little sort of stringy thingos um, in the walls and they really help, um, or they are, sorry, believed to help, I should say, um, with generating that atrial contractions. Um, there's also auricles, atrial appendages, um, which is kind of a little bit hard to visualize here. But if we go, sorry, um, if we go back a few slides, so you can see this thing here, you can see you know, how it looks like an ear is like hanging over um, the ventricle. So the part that's like hanging over the ventricle, that's referred to as an oracle, an ear-shaped thing or an atrial appendage. Um, and yeah, they just increase the service area of the heart basically. In terms of the right atria, um, the right atria has some specific additional structures that are really helpful to know. So both the AV node and SA node um, are in the wall of the right atrium. So the SA node is up here and the AV node is down somewhere around here, um, just um, near the atrioventricular, the right AV valve or the uh, tricuspid valve. Um, the triangle of Koch is basically um, a good buzzword. Um, they might like to ask, you know, that's like the triangle you use to find the AV node. Um, I've put the boundaries inside the speaker notes. Um, and then there's the Christa terminalis. Um, so the Christa terminalis basically is the boundary between this sort of flat, um, really smooth part at the back and then kind of more around the sides in the front, this uh, really stringy part. So basically the crista terminalis is just this bit here, separating the smooth from the rough and stringy of the heart. And then there's also the opening of the coronary sinus. Um, so there's this, so there's this like little hole here um, and that's basically where all the veins, the coronary veins, um, draining the heart muscle empty into the right atrium. Right, and if you look inside the ventricles, um, some really important features are the trabeculae carni. Um, so they basically are these little, you can see these little like trabeculations, again, more stringy stuff on the walls of the ventricles. And they're useful for two purposes. Um, so first, they prevent the stasis of the blood. Um, so kind of, you know, if you think about it, like if you just had a smooth wall, like the blood 
when the heart is relaxed um, might pull, but because you know there's all these like um, trabeculations, the blood flows around them and um, is less likely to pull, so that prevents clotting. Um, the trabeculae carni also prevent the ventricles from being sucked closed um, at the end of contraction, and the reason is it's kind of if you think about like two flat surfaces, um, it's much easier to like suck them together than if you have like two um, honeycomb-like surfaces. Um, that's the best way I can explain it, but just, I guess, you know, um, try it out with a couple of um, different materials or think and have a bit of a think about it to understand. And then there's cordae uh, tendony. So the cordae tendony um, or cordae tendine um, are these little structures here extending from the atrioventricular valves into these little bits of muscle called papillary muscle. Um, so basically what happens is that the papillary muscle um, pulls on the cordae tendony during ventricular contraction or systole to prevent um, the valves from basically prolapsing back into the atrium. Um, so they basically, um, you know, they essentially like ensure that when the valves are closed by the force of the blood pushing back on it, they don't um, like close too much and end up going into the atrium and causing lots of problems there. There's also something called a septomarginal trabecular or moderator band. So you can see this little bit here. And that's actually a bit of an electrical fiber, if you will, between um, the, sorry, a bit of a mind blank, between the, um, the fiber, the septal fibers running in the middle here, um, the electrical fibers running in the middle here um, to the papillary muscle. And this basically allows the papillary muscle to contract, I guess, in sync um, with the heart. So that that way, you know, I mean, it only contracts at the end of um, systole and not, sorry, during systole and not um, at any other time. Right, so um, in terms of this, um, a good clinical application is apex beat displacements and sternal heaves. Um, so they're both palpable signs, as it says on clinical examination. Um, so you can feel the sternal heaves here and the apex beat down here um, around the fifth or six interspaces. And, this is, and the significance here um, is that they indicate enlarged ventricles, which indicates reduced heart efficiency and potentially heart failure. So the apex beak is an enlarged left ventricle and um, sternal heaves is enlarged uh, right ventricle. And um, it's called, this is called core pulmonale um, when it's caused by a pulmonary or lung um, issue. Right, um, in terms of valves, so there's four valves um, which act as one way doors for blood. And the important thing to know is that the valves open and close passively. Um, so there's actually no muscles pulling on the valves um, to get them closed. Um, you might ask, you know, kind of like what role does the papillary muscles play um, in the left ventricle? They actually don't pull the valves closed, they just prevent the valves from closing too much. The valves close based on the differences in pressure gradients, um, which I'm sure you've covered in physiology. So um, we could classify valves as either semilunar valves um, going between the ventricles and the major arteries. Um, so these are the aortic valve here and the pulmonary valve. Um, they're called semilunar because they look like moons. And then there's two um, atrioventricular valves. So there's the tricuspid valve here um, between the right atrium and right, um, yeah, right atrium and right ventricle, and then the mitral or bicuspid valve between the left atrium and left ventricle. Right, um, so now we'll move on to a bit of embryology. So as I said, um, watch the video, that explains it really well. Um, but basically it starts, it's in the third week to the fourth week and continues for several weeks afterwards. Um, of development. The heart starts off as this linear tube um, fixed at both ends and then basically a bit of looping and folding happens. Um, and in this process of looping and folding, um, the primitive ventricles and primitive atria, um, you can see in these diagrams, they enlarge um, a lot more, they enlarge real greatly and they enlarge so much that they actually sort of come and collapse down, falling down over um, these fixed um, inflow and outflow tracked vessels. So you can see here in this image, um, starts with a straight line, ventricles and atria, um, the bulges, they, come, they get bigger, they bulge out and they fall down over um, 
the great vessels or the future great vessels. And then after that, um, septation occurs in which kind of we start to divide the ventricles and atria into a right and the left side um, as seen in the adult. So they start off as just um, one ventricle and one atrium. And then finally, um, valves occur and the outflow tract um, divides. Right, so in terms of septation, um, this is I think a bit that's really important to know um, for clinical correlates, so I'll touch on it here. So there's an atrium and a ventricular septum. Um, the atrial septum separates the right atrium from the left atrium, ventricular septum separates the two ventricles. Okay, so what happens in development is both septa grow towards this endocardial cushion in yellow in the middle of the heart. Um, in terms of the atrial septum, it consists of two uh, membranes. So it consists of two membranes, um, a septum primum and a septum secundum. Um, so as you might suggest, as you might think, um, the septum primum comes, develops first and then the septum secundum. Um, I've explained it further in the notes, but what you really need to know um, kind of for clinical applications is that the septum secundum has a hole called the foramen ovale and the septum primum um, is kind of, I guess, like a bit of a, um, so I say like a sort of a flap, as you can see on the right. <coughs> Sorry, at the top, um, pardon me. Um, it's kind of like a flexible flap, right? So the septum primum um, sort of opens to let blood in through from the right atrium to the left atrium. And blood needs to go from the right atrium to the left atrium before birth. Because remember, the lungs haven't formed yet. So there's no point in the blood going to the right ventricle into the lungs and back. So we just have this little shunt um, to, you know, just take it directly across into the left atrium um, and then down to left ventricles. Okay, so that's the septum. Um, the ventricular septum is less interesting. It just grows up towards the endocardial cushion from the bottom of the ventricles. Um, but yeah, what you really need to know is how um, these two how the uh, septum primum and septum secundum and the foramen ovale are related to each other. And also um, kind of leading on from that after birth, what's supposed to happen is that as, um, as the lungs open, as um, kind of, you know, air flows into the lungs, um, we can start to get, you know, blood flow into the lungs as well. And this blood comes back in through the left atrium which means that, you know, there will be this massive pushing force in the left atrium, pushing against the right atrium, pushing towards the left. And this essentially pushes the elastic flap, the septum primum shut against the oval fossa, um, sorry, the foramen ovale, and it closes the foramen ovale to form an oval fossa. And that's what happens normally. Right. Um, so uh, in terms of kind of what the clinical application of this is, um, you can look at septal defects. So there is an atrial uh, septal defect and a ventricular septal, septal, de septal defect. And basically an atrial septal defect um, results when there's a patent um, foramen ovale. Um, so in the, so when we saw in the previous image, you know, the foramen ovale was supposed to close and form an oval fossa. So that doesn't happen. And then you have a permanent hole um, between the two atria. And the ventricular septal defect um, is basically kind of just the same thing, but in the ventricles. And in these defects, um, blood flows from left to right. And this is what we call a left to right shunt. And the reason this happens is because um, in, uh, in the adult circulation, the left side of circulation has a much higher pressure than the right side of circulation. So it pushes all the blood towards the right. Okay. Um, right. And then the tetralogy of Fallot is another thing um, which they might ask you about. Um, so the tetralogy of Fallot, as the name suggests, has four things. So there's an interventricular septal defect. Um, there's a hole in the ventricular septa. And accompanying this, there needs to be an overriding aorta. So you can see here, the aorta basically sits above the hole. Um, there's pulmonary stenosis because there's more blood going to the pulmonary arteries, which we'll get to later. And then there's right ventricular hypertrophy. Um, 
which I'll also explain a bit later. So I think to the tetralogy of Fallot is best explained in terms of um, physiology and I guess the end outcomes. So what happens is because of this like hole, right, um, the blood that's coming in through the left ventricle mixes with this blood in the right ventricle. And then, um, you know, because of the pressure, like the blood from the left ventricle gets pushed across to the right ventricle. So you've got a heaps of blood in the right ventricle and it's all trying to get into this pulmonary artery to go to the lungs. And then this causes pulmonary stenosis because of the pressure on the pulmonary artery. And um, the right ventricle, right, right ventricle um, hypertrophies to try and compensate because there's so much extra blood, it has to get bigger to try and push it all into the pulmonary arteries. And then the outcome of this um, is, kind of, I guess, as you might suggest, um, as you might sort of uh, glean, the oxygenated blood coming from the lungs goes back to the lungs. And then some, so that's basically, you know, wasting our time in circulation. And then some of the deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle sort of leaks out into this aorta and gets out um, into, the, uh, into the systemic circulation. So it's definitely um, not a good thing. You need urgent surgery, as it says. Right, um, some other pathologies. So there's a patent ductus arteriosus um, thing over here. So this is basically where the ductus arteriosus um, remains open. The ductus arteriosus um, basically is something which uh, allows blood to travel from the pulmonary arteries um, right into the aorta in, um, in, uh, in, in development rather than going to the lungs. And then the significance of this in adulthood is the oxygenated blood um, travels back into the pulmonary circulation. And then we, as a result, we sort of overload um, the right side of the heart because it's got this sort of back pressure here. Another really important thing is coarction of the aorta. Um, so kind of think of it as like a bit of a ring um, from, so, okay. So what happens is the ductus arteriosus um, is supposed to become the ligamentum arteriosum and this ligament, but in coarction, this ligament is too tight and it forms a bit of a constrictive ring around this aorta. So it leads to decreased blood flow um, distally to the coarction. And then that's when you can get things like radio, radial delay. Like for example, could be between, um, you know, that would be where the defect would be between the right um, brachiocephalic trunk coming out and the left um, subclavian and common carotid arteries. And then there's also a transposition of the great vessels. So this is this diagram here. Um, basically they're swapped. So, you know, as you can imagine, it's pretty um, devastating. Like all the deoxygenated blood just goes back to the aorta, or, or aorta and all the oxygenated blood from the lungs goes back to the lungs. So um, no oxygenated blood in the systemic circulation. Aortic sinuses. Right, um, ooh, just realizing we're running low on time, but aortic sinuses provide openings essentially for blood to flow into the coronary arteries. So they're basically the beginnings of the coronary arteries. Um, and blood basically flows into aortic sinuses um, in a retrograde pattern. Um, I won't go through that for time reasons, um, but just know that um, you know, the blood actually flows back into the coronary sinuses and coronary arteries, not forwards. Um, and the aortic sinuses are located within the leaflets of the aortic valve. So you can see in this image on the right, um, you know, each valve has leaflets. And in the aortic valve, the left and right leaflets um, are the ones with the sinuses and the coronary arteries. Um, kind of, you can remember it as in there's only a left and a right coronary artery. There's no posterior coronary artery. So the posterior leaflet doesn't have a sinus. Right, coronary arteries. So we'll just quickly take you through them. Um, so we've got a left coronary artery and the right coronary artery. So the left coronary artery um, has a, uh, has several branches. So it's got an, the major branch is the anterior interventricular branch, otherwise known as the left anterior descending branch. Um, it's known as the widow maker um, more colloquially because it's the most commonly affected artery in a heart attack or an AMI. And then there's a, uh, there's a marginal artery um, kind of supplying the outside of the left ventricle and a circumflex artery going back and supplying the left atrium. Um, the, sorry, the other thing is um, the anterior interventricular artery or the left anterior descend, descending artery um, basically 
is the one that supplies most of, um, or the anterior two thirds of the ventricular septum and most of the left and right ventricles. In the right coronary artery, um, there's a marginal branch supplying a lot of the right ventricle. Um, and then if you go around the back, um, you can see that there's a posterior interventricular branch. So that supplies a posterior third of the interventricular septum. And then you can see as well, um, a branch towards the SA nodes um, that often comes from the right coronary artery. And then the little branch here is the branch towards the AV node. Right, so coronary artery dominance. Um, this is determined by the artery that supplies the posterior interventricular artery. Um, so 70% of people are right dominant and 30% of people are left dominant. And the significance here is that like, if you had a left dominant circulation, right? Um, basically both the anterior and posterior interventricular artery. So the entire septum and almost all of your ventricles will be supplied by the left anterior descending artery. The problem is, of course, the left anterior descending is the most commonly affected artery in a heart attack. So if you have a heart attack there and you're left dominant, basically um, your whole ventricles are kind of screwed. So much more dangerous. Um, yeah, okay. in terms of time, um, we're running out. So I won't go through this one. This is just another clinical application. Um, you can read through the slides, I guess, later and a little summary table. Um, and then we've got cardiac veins, right. So um, there are, I guess, four major structures you need to know. You need to know the coronary sinus, which is where all the veins drain into. You need to know the great cardiac vein, the middle cardiac vein, and the small cardiac vein. A really nice mnemonic um, is GLAMPSA. Um, so you think of like glamping, GLAMPSA. Um, so the great cardiac vein supply, it basically follows the left coronary artery. Um, and a little bit of the left anterior descending artery. The middle cardiac vein follows the posterior interventricular artery, so that's M and P, and then SNR, small cardiac vein, follows right coronary and right marginal. Right, innovation of the heart, um, just quickly, there's a sympathetic part and a parasympathetic part. Sympathetics come directly from the sympathetic trunk, the T1 to T5 region and they supply not only the nodes, but also heart muscle and the Purkinje fibers um, carrying the contraction, um, the elect electrical excitation, sorry. Um, parasympathetics, they come from the vagus nerves, which you might hear is cranial nerve 10 next year, and they mainly only supply the nodes. Okay, and then this just tells you um, what they do. Right, um, sensory innovation um, is kind of, I guess, depends. For the heart, it depends on if um, the part affected is in the pericardium or the heart itself, the myocardium. So the pericardium is innervated by the intercostal nerves. And then that produces um, what we call a pleuritic chest pain. So, you know, that's like somatic pain, I think, as Michelle talks about it. So it's really accurately located, really sharp. Um, cardiac pain from the myocardium is transmitted through the vagus nerves. So that's visceral pain really poorly located, often like radiates um, to the jaw, left shoulder, and it's a really crushing pain. Okay, right, so now in the last few minutes, we'll quickly go through the back. So um, here are some learning objectives. Basically, um, what we really need to know is what the vertebra are, what they do, what's inside the vertebral canal and spinal cord, and a little bit about um, some spinal nerve pathways. So what is a vertebra? So the vertebra is a bone of the back. There's uh, quite a few of them, I think 31. Um, so there's seven in the cervical region, 12 in the thoracic region. Um, sorry, I forgot, uh, five in the lumbar region, five lumbar vertebrae, um, and then one sacrum and one coccyx. So in terms of the parts of the vertebra, there's a body. Um, you can see there's a couple of pedicles, right? Like um, sort of, I guess, if you think of it as like feet connecting to these bit here and um, a lamina as well, and then the spinous process. And then, um, so these are, I guess, all of our, um, these form the vertebral arch, the pedicle, lamina, and spinous process. And then after that, we have some um, articular facets and processes. So the transverse um, process and transverse costal facet articulate with the ribs, the tubercles that I talked about earlier. And then you've got the superior, 
costal facets and the inferior costal facets also articulating with the ribs. And there's also a superior articular process and facet and an inferior articular process and facet and therefore articulating between um, different vertebrae within the spine. Right, um, so in terms of vertebral ligaments, um, again, there's quite a, there's several, um, but the main ones you need to know are the supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament um, between the spines, ligament, ligamentum flavum um, between the laminae and then the anterior, sorry, posterior and anterior longitudinal ligaments. Um, so yeah, this is kind of one of those things like flashcards and repetition helps. Intervertebral joints and discs, um, I guess not all that high yield, but just for discs, know that there's a nucleus pulposus, a bit of a spongy gel-like bit in the middle, and then annulus fibrosus, which is this really tight sort of ring, fibrocartilaginous ring that holds it all together. Okay, right, another thing you might um, want to know is the regional differences between the vertebra. So um, across the spinal cord, um, it's important to know that the vertebra are not the same. So if we start off by looking at the um, vertebral bodies, um, you can see that the cervical vertebra has a quite a small body, um, quite oval shaped, and then the body gets bigger as you move down to the thoracic and biggest in the lumbar. And that's because um, you know, the amount of weight on the vertebral column sort of like increases as you go down because you add on all the weight on top of it. Um, so the bodies need to get bigger to accommodate that. The vertebral foramen, um, conversely, actually gets smaller as you go from the cervical to thoracic and then lumbar. And that's because um, the spinal cord gets thinner and thinner um, in general as more and more nerves leave. Um, so, you know, you probably heard of, you know, the brachial plexus, et cetera, like as the nerves for that leave, um, the spinal cord gets thinner. Spinous processes, uh, main thing to know is that the cervical vertebra has a, what we call a bifid, a two-part spinous process. All other vertebra have just one part. Transverse processes, cervical vertebrae have transverse foramina, um, whereas in all the other vertebrae, there's thoracic and lumbar, there's no foramina. And then another thing, um, I guess, which you might like to know is, which is not in here, is that actually um, the cervical and lumbar vertebra have this sort of um, triangular ovoid shape for the vertebral foramen, whereas the thoracic vertebra is just a circle. Right. Um, so there's some special vertebrae. Um, so we've got the atlas, which is C1. Um, it's a little bit different to the others. So instead of having a body and a normal arch. It's just got two arches, an anterior arch, pardon me, and a posterior arch. And um, it's sort of articular processes become lateral masses on the side here. Um, and there's also um, yeah, just a transverse foramen like any other cervical vertebra. In terms of the axis, um, there's a dens. So you can see this nice little bit poking up and then a pars interarticularis as well. Um, so that's, I guess, the bit between the superior and inferior articular processes. Um, so it would sort of be in here. Um, so kind of on this diagram in here between the superior and inferior at the top. Right. Um, so in terms of fractures of vertebra, um, this is like a really kind of common thing they like um, to know. Um, so cervical spines, there's something called facet jumping, which is really common, um, which is which it takes a bit of time to explain. So the explanation is in the notes. Um, I'll skip over that for now. Um, in terms of the atlas, um, the C1, and uh, the most common fracture of that is a Jefferson fracture. So that's where you fracture kind of both the anterior and posterior arches, as you can see in B. In C2, the axis, there's two fractures, um, which I'd like you to know. There's a Hayman's fracture. So that's a fracture of that pars interarticularis. So you can see sort of here, it's a little crack um, between the superior and inferior articular processes or facets. And there's a fracture of the dens, um, which I guess you might guess is, you know, just this dens, this bit sticking up, um, getting sort of cut off from the rest of C2. Right, um, don't worry about that. Um, don't worry about that. You can look, sorry, you can look at that um, in your own time, the notes. 
Okay, so the vertebral canal um, inside the vertebral foramen, um, there are a few structures, and I think it's really nice to look at them in this layers approach. So um, we've got the bony boundaries on the outside, and then um, outside the extra, outside the dura mater, we have the extra dural epidural space. And this consists of these two things here, the extra dural fat and Batson's venous plexus, which I'll talk about later. And um, there's a dura mater and then, or dura mater. Uh, and then inside that, there's a subdural space, which is empty, um, know that. There's the arachnoid mater, and then inside that, there's a subarachnoid space that has the arteries. So the arteries in the subarachnoid space and the veins in the extra dural or epidural space, and then the pia mater, and then we have the spinal cord. Right. Um, now, the really nice thing, um, so a really important thing, I think, with the veins that they want you to know is um, how Batson's venous plexus, the veins are actually uh, valveless. So, um, the, so that's really significant because normally um, in cases of cancer and infection, the valves help to, you know, stop the um, clumps of tumors or the bacteria from spreading and like kind of try and direct them towards the lymphatic system. Whereas because this is valveless, um, you know, the bacteria and tumor cells can just spread up and down the vertebral columns really nearly. And the other worrying thing about this is that the bladder, prostate, and rectum, and the breast, they are all supplied by this valveless Batson's plexus as well. So a cancer in any of these regions can easily get into the vertebral column, spinal cord, get into, um, I guess, the spinal nerve roots, and also travel up and get into the brain potentially. Right, um, spinal cord um, versus vertebral column. Spinal cord, um, you can see, it's a little bit different in that it doesn't actually go through the whole vertebral column. So um, you can see here, it, you know, it comes all the way down and then in L1 and L2, um, it ends in this little cone that we call the conus medullaris. So that's where the spinal cord ends. And below that, it's just um, a series of nerve fibers known as the corda equina. Um, and the significance of this is that you need to go below uh, the conus medullaris in the L1 or L2 region for lumbar puncture, which I'll just talk about more in the next slide. So for the levels, um, you play it safe. So it ends at L1, L2, we go a couple below, we go L3, L4 into space or L5, L4, L5 into space. Um, yeah, it's a little bit different in children. Um, it must go a little bit lower and, uh, Email me for the reason, um, if you want to know the reason why that is. In terms of layers in lumbar puncture, so after getting through the skin and superficial fascia, um, you will first get to the ligamentum flavor. So that little between, ligament between the laminae, so that's the first pop. And for an epidural anesthetic, you just stop there. Um, if you want to look at the CSF, right, you need to go into the next space, the uh, subarachnoid space. Um, remembering that the subdural space is empty. So you need to go through the epidural, sorry, you need to go through the dura mater, um, and then that constitutes the second pop. So that could be um, yeah, just like a nice way to conceptualize it. Right, um, don't worry about that. Oh yeah, in terms of muscle groups, um, so you don't really need to know a lot about the muscles, to be honest. Um, there's a lot of them and they're not really very high yield, but I will say that the extrinsic muscles, especially uh, the superficial layer with trapezius, lat dorsi, um, levator, scapulae, and your rhomboids, um, they are kind of important. So just know that. And for the rest of them, you just really need to know that there's like three groups, um, superficial, the splenius groups, intermediate, the erector spinae, and then deep transverso spinalis. And um, for the erector spinae, it might be nice to just, I guess, just to know the names of the three muscles in there. Right, um, so thanks for that. Um, thanks for listening. I have a few questions, but um, considering the time, I know Peter's got to come and do his lecture. Um, so I'll stop it there. Um, thanks so much for your time. Feel free to email me if you've got any questions. Um, I'll upload the questions um, onto the post slide so you can do them at your leisure. And um, best of luck for the exams. I'm sure you guys will smash it. Try not to worry. And um, yeah, have a good uh, rest of the year and um, holidays.
Right, stop sharing.